So the GMTK Game Jam is coming up and I'm planning to participate in it. But this won't be just some normal Game Jam devlog. I'm not going to be using Unity, Godot, or any other game engines in this jam. I'm going to be making a game for the GMTK Game Jam 2022 with Rust and Bevy. If you don't know what Rust is, Rust is a programming language and according to some people it's the future of programming. It's fast and it's built to replace C++. Unfortunately, if you didn't know already, I don't know how to use Rust. I've never featured it in any of my videos and I had only gotten my hands on it last week. So I have a very limited understanding. The framework I'm going to be using for this game will be Bevy, a refreshingly simple data-driven game engine built in Rust and features an ECS and C component system and a 3D renderer among other things. Even though an ECS is considered one of the fastest ways that a game engine can run, and did I mention that the code structure is also cleaner, it's also very hard to write code for and requires me to actually have a few brain cells. If you want to know what an ECS is in more detail, you should do some research by yourself, as it's a pretty complicated topic. Without any further ado, let's hop into the video. When the game jam started, the theme was revealed... Roll of the Dice To be honest with you, I did not like this theme. Honestly, I was ready to give up at first. I couldn't think of an idea, and the theme didn't leave much permutation. I knew a lot of people were going to have the same game, and I didn't want that to happen to me. Even so, I pushed through and thought of an idea that other people definitely won't have. Spoiler alert, I was wrong. Alright, anyway, I was inspired by the game Block Swords. It's an old Flash game. You would roll around with WASD and the arrow keys, but instead of a brick, like in Block Swords, we could use a dice. Instead of trying to fall into a hole, we could try to get two on the dice. So I started off by opening the command prompt and running cargo new to create a new Rust project. I then opened the project in VS Code and tried to get a 3D model loaded into the scene. First I made a wall model in Blender, and after looking through the conveniently arranged Bevy examples on bevyengine.org, which also contained web builds showing you results in the browser, I was able to get my wall model on screen without much trouble. As I fiddled a bit more with Bevy, I was able to get two models on screen, a dice and a wall, but I needed a more flexible way to add objects into the game than just coding them in. And because I wanted this game to be 3D and tile based, I used LDTK, the Level Designer Toolkit, at least I think that's what it stands for. I created in-grid layers which made each tile contain an integer. I'll use these integers as a flag to store information such as the position of the player, the position of a wall, the position of a floor, or position of an air. It can also be used to store the positions of level, beginnings, and ends, and more. As you can see, this is the first level, and one represents the walls while two represents the floor. Having nothing will default to air, which is basically the same as a wall, but we won't render anything in that tile. After I got my LDTK level set up, I got started trying to get it into the game. To load the map, I'm going to be using bevy underscore ECS underscore LDTK, which is a library used for loading and drawing tile maps from LDTK. I'm only going to be using the loading functionalities of the library because I'm not going to be using traditional 2D tiles for this game. Instead, I'm going to be using 3D models as the individual tiles. Loading in the map was easy, but spawning in 3D models to replace the tiles was a bit hard. I had to create a spawning system which parsed the map and spawned 3D models according to what number was in each tile. After this was done, we had a fully functional 3D tile map loaded into the scene. After this, it was time to load the player in the scene. And I easily did this by adding a new int grid that would represent where the player would spawn. So I spawned in the player at that position. However, player movement would not be so easy. I struggled through getting the player to rotate for a whole day and wasted lots of productivity on it. The player would always rotate on different axes and I couldn't tell why. The X rotations were always correct, but sometimes, for no reason, the player would suddenly rotate on a different axis when it was supposed to rotate on the Y axis. I discovered this was because I was using local rotations and in order to fix this, I would need to be using global rotations. However, I couldn't find a way to do global rotations in Bevy. Remember, I'm pretty new to Bevy. I never even tried to give up on this until I was halfway through the gym and it was clear that I was getting nowhere. So you may be wondering, how did I make a game? Well, I was able to turn this bug into a feature, which I'm pretty proud of, and it may have actually made the game stand out a bit, compared to the other dice rotating puzzle games. When the player moves east or west, the dice will be reset to 1. And to make players think this is a mechanic, we'll make the dice do an expanding animation whenever it's reset to 1. Even after this, the game was looking quite bad. There was no lighting, so I decided to fix that. I started out by adding some light to the corner just to test it out. The light looked actually quite good, and after some tweaking of intensity, it looked much better. But I don't just want the light to stay in the corner. So instead, I made the light hover just a distance away from the player, so it looked more dynamic. Finally, there were just a few things remaining to add to the game until I was done. I need to add collisions with the tile map and new levels. Implementing collisions was pretty easy because we had access to a tile map containing an array of where all the collisions were. 
All I needed to do was add a check before the player moves to see if the targeted position was clear. To do this, the player starts with a position on the grid stored as a parameter, and as it moves, we'll update the grid position accordingly by adding or subtracting 1 to x and y accordingly. Putting this together with a check before we move, the player won't phase into walls anymore. Next it was time to start designing some new levels. I wanted to put together a decent amount of levels, so I aimed for 10 levels. Most of my Game Jam games in the past have either been really short with a very small amount of levels, or were endless games where you try to survive as long as you can. I tried to get 10 levels because if you knew how to play the game, then you would easily be able to see the patterns in the levels and get through them extremely quickly. Now while the level design montage is still running, it's probably a good time to say this. You should subscribe because I spent a lot of time painfully stitching together almost 24 hours of footage, some of which is incomplete, to create this video. And it would really help motivate me to continue working on game dev and YouTube if you subscribe. Thanks. Anyway, back to the video. The next thing I needed to do was actually incorporate the levels into the game. To do this, I had to a win condition for the levels because right now, all you can do is navigate the level. You can't move on to the next level or do anything at all. It's pretty pointless right now. To figure out if the dice has two on its face, all you have to do is check the rotation of the dice to see if it is the same as a dice that has two on its face. To check if the dice is at the end of the level, I can just check if the distance of the dice is close enough to the end of the level. Combining these two conditions and checking if both of them are satisfied, this will tell us when to move on to the next level. So after this, I was done with the initial build of the game for desktop. One thing people usually want from a Game Jam game is a web build. People aren't just satisfied with the download. Some malicious developers might hide viruses in these games, and humans are also lazy by nature, and they don't want to download a build even if it is really small. Making a game in Bevy does have it smaller than large Unity games with hundreds of megabytes, but even so, I got started working on a web build. Bevy actually has built-in web build, which just require you to run a few commands in the command prompt. However, unlike Unity, you have to create your own index.html file, which runs the actual game and displays everything on screen. I used a tutorial online which I'll link in the description which already had a template index.html file. And so I added an additional bevy sound fix script to this html file and after this I had a web build done. I uploaded the game to itch.io, made a decent thumbnail in photoshop and started rating other people's games. I think I did fairly well in this jam relative to the tools that I had access to. Remember that I only got my hands on Rust and Bevy a week ago. Even if I had a lot of experience with Rust and Bevy, creating a game with these much lower level tools compared to Unity, Godot, or Game Maker does require a lot of work. I'm just happy that I finished the game even if it had a few major bugs such as occasionally freezing on level 3 or just being generally boring. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, remember to like and subscribe. Bye.